So uh, now I'm going to talk to you uh, in my uh, research hat uh, rather than my organizer hat for this event. Uh, microphone is off. Looks like it's on. Microphone is on now. Better? Yeah, I need something. I know, next time I'll wear a tie. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to talk to you now in my role as a researcher uh, rather than my role as a, an organizer of this workshop. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about uh, my work on accountability and uh, even less about my work on privacy. Um, and, uh, but both of these are examples of what I consider sort of my research approach, which is to take a foundational approach to secure and trustworthy cyberspace, looking to answer questions like what is the boundary between what's possible and what's not possible? Um, are there fundamental trade-offs between things like security and efficiency, uh, communication and computation, privacy and usability? And uh, the insight gained here not only sort of advances the, the state of our knowledge, but also uh, can lead to more informed choices by um, by people who are making decisions about how to implement systems or what uh, implemented <coughs> systems to use or what policies to use at, at sort of a policy level as well as to better system design. And throughout this, um, thinking about uh, users, uses, and usability is critical. In particular, recognizing that different parties involved have different goals and different values and so um, you can't just assume everyone's on, on the same page. And um, I partly mentioned this uh, here because I think as you look to develop your ideas, your research ideas, and develop them from ideas to proposals, um, it's important to know your own research style. So what are your strengths, what are your experiences, what kinds of work do you find interesting and rewarding um, so that you're not just uh, sort of blindly chasing solicitations but really thinking about what it is that interests you, what do you have to offer, and then um, tuning it and tailoring it uh, to those available solicitations uh, rather than uh, just, just sort of blindly following them. So I'm going to talk uh, for most of my time about uh, accountability. And um, so both in the real world and in internet systems or cyber security, cyber, cyber systems, um, people often express a desire for accountability. Um, you know, we must have accountability so that so and so, such and such. And it's not always completely clear what people mean, but it's often about ensuring consequences of some kind for people who break the rules, uh, whether the rules are explicitly or not explicitly stated. and. Um, Doing this may or may not require identification and tracking of everyone at all times, although it's often, you know, often that we must have accountability is followed by, therefore, we need to keep track of who's doing what at all times. Um, but without actual definitions, we can't even tell uh, whether it, it actually does. And so in our work, um, uh, joint with uh, Joan Feigenbaum and Aaron Jaggard, uh, others as well on some of the work, but the, the proposals with, uh, with Joan, uh, and, uh, and Aaron, we're exploring accountability as a useful paradigm shift from uh, approaches that are only based on prevention. So how did the project develop? Well, I kept hearing people say these things. In order uh, to provide accountability, we need to be able to keep track of who's doing what. And I kept saying to myself, really? Maybe. Uh, maybe I should argue. Maybe, maybe we don't. Uh, but I, I didn't really have a basis on which to argue. Maybe they're right. And so I, I just wanted to know, like, how would we even know whether this is true or not? How do we know that in order to have accountability, you have to keep track of who's doing what when accountability isn't well defined? Even who's doing what isn't that well defined. I mean, identity is its own um, uh, vague and large uh, issue. But but it seemed like this was this was sort of tying them together in a way that it wasn't clear. And so. Um, this project was really formed out of uh, the desire to be able to find a definitive answer. Even if the answer is yes, to have accountability, you have to track what everyone's doing at all times. I'd like to at least know that, um, because again, I think that's useful for uh, guiding design of systems and design of policies. Uh, and uh, so, so I came at it, uh, you know, sort of with some sense, the answer might not be yes, you necessarily always need to, but, but open to either answer, but really just, just looking to be able to get some clarity around accountability. Um, we're not the first to, to think about accountability in the context of, um, of, of cyberspace. Uh, there are uh, some relatively recent, well, 2008, 2009 quotes, White, Cerner, and all in CACM said this hide or lose it perspective on privacy, copyright, and surveillance is increasingly inadequate. As an alternative, accountability must become a primary means through which society addresses appropriate use. Uh, Lampson, also in CACM, said misplaced emphasis on prevention rather than accountability has resulted in an unusable security technology that people do not understand and often work around. Uh, there is uh, a bunch of prior CS work, uh, much more than I have time to go into, 
uh, in a brief talk, uh, but some of which fall into what I would say are applications of uh, Lamson's kind of definition, <coughs> uh, things like accountable internet protocol and social web applications. Uh, and then there's also a, a large uh, and rich literature of crypto cryptographic applications in which participants remain anonymous unless they break the rules in some way, uh, including early uh, eCash uh, uh, work as well as later work, uh, and some work on anonymous group messaging, among others. But in all of these, um, identity plays a major role, even in most of the systems with some anonymity. So, uh, so uh, even when there's an anonymity for the participants who are not breaking the rules, the uh, breaking the rules always then goes through identity and then relies on um, that identity and the evidence of, of misbehavior to be taken to some judge who will decide what to do. And so we felt that some of the limitations of prior approaches were this reliance on identification or at least some kind of persistence identities of those held accountable, uh, reliance on authority of some kind to hold the entity accountable, and the need for that authority to take explicit action in order to hold an entity accountable. And so again, our, our thought wasn't that you don't ever want these things, often you probably do, but we wanted to understand uh, when you could get some kind of accountability mechanism that might not include those. And so as our research agenda, uh, we uh, are seeking, are, are, are currently underway in this, to formalize accountability and related concepts, um, to clarify these interrelated and often conflated notions, as well as providing a framework uh, for formal analysis, <coughs> formal at <coughs> varying levels of formality. So uh, formal analysis might actually mean you know, automated uh, analysis, or it might just mean formal in the sense that you actually have definitions and proof theorems. Uh, and then using these ideas to study accountability and identity requirements in systems. So again, looking for things like trade-offs and possibility results, and uh, in particular coming back as one of the thrusts to this question of to what extent is identity required. And so um, a toy example that kind of give you some of the ends of the spectrum here between um, accountability and, and uh, anonymous or automatic accountability that doesn't require a mediator, uh, and on the very other end, uh, prevention that, that's not about accountability after the fact, but rather about preventing the thing from happening in the first place. <clears throat> Obviously a toy example for reasons that will be very clear at the end. Uh, that uh, imagine a car dealership lot here, and so you know when you go to buy a car, you get to take a test drive. So imagine one here where, where um, the test drive um, uh, happens um, on the lot, so you can drive the, the, the car around the lot, but you're only supposed to be able to leave the, the lot if you're actually uh, buying the car. So the policy is that you can get in the car, you can drive it around in the lot and do your test driving there, but you shouldn't be able to drive the car off the lot without buying the car first. Um, so a mediated, identifiable accountability approach to this would say when the customer comes, she shows an ID and uh, signs some paperwork saying, uh, I understand that I'm not supposed to drive the car off the lot unless I buy it first, and then she's allowed to drive the car off the lot. If she turns out to leave uh, in that car without paying, she goes through the gate to leave the, the site, a judge can punish her uh, based on the presented evidence that uh, this is really who she was, um, she knew what she was doing and understood the policy, and, um, and she violated the policy. So that would be a mediated, identifiable accountability approach. A uh, prevention approach would instead have an electronic shutoff device uh, at that exit and could just keep the cars from going through the exit, and uh, this would only be disabled by